where we speak about experimental mathematics applied to the study of non-trinar recurrences. This is a talk in our seminar, but it's also a dissertation, PhD, thesis, defense. And according to custom, uh, as soon as the talk is ended, uh, at the very end, uh, after some public questions, the audience will be asked to leave and leave the deliberation for the committee, including one committee member that is not here yet, but hopefully it will be here in 15 minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming. So uh, I'm going to talk about a few results from my thesis in which I have applied uh, experimental math to solve some problems in nonlinear recurrences. So to start off so that we're all on the same page, let me define what I mean by a recurrence. So we're given some function, f, that takes in k real numbers and returns one real number. Um, and then we have k additional real numbers. Um, from that, uh, we define a recurrence by saying that r sub n is equal to this function, f, applied to r sub n minus 1 down through r sub n minus k. The initial conditions, r1 through rk, are then defined by our set x1 through xk. Now, this recurrence requires k values in order to compute the next value in the sequence, so we say that its order is k. Um, given a recurrence and a set of initial conditions, then, we produce an infinite sequence. So for example, the first uh, recurrence that people usually see is the Fibonacci recurrence. So we have f sub n is equal to f sub n minus 1 plus f sub n minus 2. This, of course, is a recurrence of order 2. The function that defines it is just x plus y, um, and the initial conditions are both 1s. And so we get this sequence down here uh, by reiterating the recurrence. Okay, so in my title, I mentioned that I'm focusing on nonlinear recurrences. Um, so let me tell you, a, a linear recurrence is one defined by a, a linear function, of course. So we've got only addition and scalar multiplication. And then everything else we throw into the class of nonlinear recurrences. And we make this distinction because linear recurrences are very well behaved. Um, so if we've got a linear recurrence, we know that we also have a, uh, a function that defines its nth term in closed form without recursing at all. Okay, but if we have a nonlinear recurrence, we don't have a general understanding of this form. So, so I'm focusing now on nonlinear recurrences. Um, and not on trying to find this general understanding, but instead on looking at some interesting phenomena that arise when we study nonlinear recurrences. Okay, so the first uh, phenomena that I'm going to talk about is global asymptotic stability. So if a recurrence is globally asymptotically stable, that means that every sequence that it produces converges independent of the initial conditions. And moreover, it always converges to the same value. This is something interesting that we'll study in, in a couple of slides. All right, so the next is uh, surprising integer sequences. So this is when we have a recurrence that we know is going to produce rational numbers, but we in, in fact observe that we're going to produce integer numbers. And this is surprising. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about surprising rational sequences when we expect complex numbers to be produced. Uh, but instead are observing rational numbers. Okay, so now I'm going to dive into studying global asymptotic stability, and I'm going to tell you about a proof algorithm that I've created uh, to, to prove global asymptotic stability. So a few definitions are needed. Uh, first, I'm going to define a rational difference equation in the same way that I define a, a recurrence, uh, because a difference equation really is just a recurrence. Right? It's just convention within this field of stability to call them difference equations, so I'm going to adhere to that convention. Okay, so we've got our function, which is now a rational function, so ratio of polynomials. Um, we have a couple of stipulations. First, that the coefficients in our <coughs> rational function must all be positive, uh, and then the initial conditions also must be positive. And we make this uh, criteria because we don't want to divide by zero. So if everything's positive, we're not going to divide by zero. Um, I also want to point out another convention. And that is that we start our index here at negative k rather than at 0 or 1. And this is, again, just convention within this field, and so I'm going I'm to keep that convention. Okay, for example, uh, here's a, a rational difference equation where we say that the n plus first term is equal to 4 plus the nth term divided by 1 plus the n minus first term. <coughs> okay, now let's, let's say that we have a fixed uh, rational difference equation. Um, and we're going to not fix the, the um, initial conditions, but we're going to consider that we've, we've picked a specific rational difference equation. Now, if our initial conditions are all taken to equal the same value, x bar, and then from those initial conditions we get the constant sequence all equal to x bar, we're going to call that value an equilibrium. We can easily find an equilibrium given a rational difference equation by solving this equation here. 
which says that if our initial conditions are all equal to x bar, the next term in the sequence must also equal x bar, and then we just iterate off to infinity and we get the constant sequence x bar. So for example, um, here's the difference equation that I gave on the previous slide that I'm going to come back to as an example throughout this section. We get two possibilities when we solve this, two and negative two, but since our initial conditions must be positive, uh, we have to pick the positive two. Okay, now I can uh, give you the definition for global asymptotic stability. So again, we've fixed our, our difference equation, and we've not fixed our initial conditions. So if it turns out that with every set of initial conditions that we look at, we always converge to the specific um, equilibrium, then we're going to say that we have global asymptotic stability. And we say that the equilibrium itself is globally asymptotically stable. It's basically attracting everything that, that we give it. Um, so, yeah, and, and also the initial conditions must be positive. Okay, so this is something that I want to explain and, and show you an algorithm that I've created. Uh, but before I can give you my algorithm, I want to give uh, a little bit of background on how people have been approaching this problem. Okay, so typically we've got our rational difference equation and we want to prove that its equilibrium is globally asymptotically stable. Uh, so we look at a list of a bunch of theorems and we kind of see which theorem applies to our particular rational difference equation. The problem here is that uh, given two different rational difference equations, their proofs of global stability may be very different from each other. And, and this is not always what we want. So uh, instead, my approach has been to teach a computer how to prove global asymptotic stability. And in this sense, we'll have an <coughs> algorithm, algorithm that we can approach or can apply uh, so that the proofs of global asymptotic stability are all kind of the same. They follow the same sequence of steps. Okay, so now my goal is going to be to tell you about the algorithm that I've created that takes as input a rational difference equation and an equilibrium, um, and then uh, outputs a rigorous proof that it's globally asymptotically stable. Okay. I need to give you a little bit of notation before I can tell you about the algorithm. So I told you that this rational difference equation uh, is given by a map that takes in k plus 1 values and outputs 1 value. But what I'd really like is something that I can iterate with itself. right? so that I can say that the nth term in our sequence is some function applied um, to, the, to the initial conditions n times, right, iterated. Okay, so instead, we're going to look at this vectorized equation here. So we're going to take in the same input, again, k plus 1 consecutive values in our sequence, and then we're going to return now the next, the k plus 1 consecutive values, just looking one further down in the sequence. So uh, our input starts at xn, our output will start at xn plus 1. Okay, I'm going to call these capital Xn's. And now we see that, um, in fact, we can say that um, Xn plus 1 is Q composed with itself n plus 1 times applied to the initial conditions. Right, so for example, here's the difference equation that I've been using as our example. Um, pretty self-explanatory. So now my goal is to create an algorithm that takes its input now a vectorized rational difference equation and a vectorized equilibrium, which is just the equilibrium repeated K plus 1 times. Right? And we want to show that, um, that we've got this vectorized equilibrium is globally asymptotically stable. And it's really the same idea. Now we've got a sequence of vectors, and we want to show that they converge to this vector that's the equilibrium. Okay. All right. So now uh, an interesting theorem that is what my algorithm is kind of based off of. So in 1999, uh, Cruz and Nesman uh, proved the following theorem. So we've got our vectorized rational difference equation and a unique equilibrium, which is important. Right? If we don't have a unique equilibrium, then, uh, then the other equilibrium is not going to converge to the, the first equilibrium. Right? We're going to get two different equilibrium solutions. Okay, so if I can find some positive integer k so that this inequality here is true, then I claim we have global asymptotic stability. Right? So let me kind of intuitively tell you why this should be true. So if we pick any vector k, where the, co where the coordinates of this vector are positive, right? we can think of that as being uh, a term in our sequence. Right? And now then, if we apply q k times to that, it's the same thing as, uh, as looking um, k terms down in our sequence. Okay? And this inequality is telling us that no matter what we started with, uh, we must be shrinking the distance to the equilibrium. Right? So since this x was arbitrary, and our initial conditions are also arbitrary, if we're shrinking distances every time we look further down in the sequence, we know we must be converging uh, to our equilibrium. And this here, this theorem is going to be the, the basis of my algorithm. 
But in that theorem, you don't need a, a separation from one, meaning you, it's just right. Yeah, the proof um, re relies on a compactness argument. So let me summarize uh, how far we've gotten. So we've got our rational difference equation, and we've solved for its equilibrium. We then created the vectorized difference equation and the vectorized equilibrium, and now our goal is to find some positive integer k that satisfies this inequality here. For all x where the coordinates are positive and, and not the equilibrium value. Right. So uh, let's forget for a moment about how we might find such a k. Let's say we've conjectured a k, and we want to show that it does, in fact, uh, satisfy this, this inequality here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a polynomial given that k um, by taking the numerator here of this difference of norms squared. This in fact is a polynomial because the, the square and the norm gets rid of the square root in the Euclidean norm. Um, and I claim that if this polynomial here is positive, then we have global asymptotic stability. Okay, so I just need to show you that this polynomial being positive implies this ratio being less than 1 in the previous theorem. So first of all, um, if we just look at the difference of norm squared, the denominator is a product of squares. Right? So uh, we must have that the denominator is positive. Okay? So if the whole thing was, po if the numerator is positive, then the whole difference of norm squared is positive. And now we can just rearrange this and get that the inequality we wanted to be true is in fact true. Okay? So now we've really reduced the problem of global asymptotic stability to that of proving that an associated polynomial is positive. We have yet to discover how we can conjecture this k, but I'll talk slightly about that at the end. Okay. So our new goal now is to create an algorithm that takes as input a polynomial and, and outputs a proof that that polynomial is positive in the positive um, region. Uh, and I didn't say on the previous slide, I, I had written it, but I didn't say it. Um, the positive region I'm going to call the positive orthant. Right? It's a quadrant in many dimensions. Okay, so. Um, we need to find a way to prove that this polynomial is positive in the positive orthant. So I'm going to show you a couple of tests that I'll utilize in the main algorithm. The first <coughs> test is quite trivial. If all of the coefficients in our polynomial are positive, then the polynomial must have been positive, right? Nothing too exciting here, but it's true. Next, something a little bit less trivial, but still pretty easy to see. What, what if we have uh, negative coefficients that are only on the terms of the form xi times xj? What we're going to do then, here's an example at the bottom, we're going to look at a sub-polynomial taking just the quadratic terms and their, uh, their respective coefficients. Okay? And we're going to try to show that this sub-polynomial is positive. We're going to treat it as a quadratic form and show that it's positive definite, which is just a fancy way of saying that it's always positive. In two variables, we can use the discriminant of the polynomial. Right here at the bottom, we've got the discriminant is negative, so that means the only roots are imaginary, and so the polynomial must be either positive or negative, always. So we just test a point and see if it's positive. Here, um, x and y both equaling, equaling 1, we see that uh, the polynomial, the subpolynomial must be positive. Right? If this quadratic subpolynomial is positive, then the whole polynomial must have been positive because the rest of the coefficients were always positive. Okay? So these two tests are, are too much to expect for these polynomials to have. Uh, but it turns out we can make um, smaller polynomials from our original polynomial and show that these, these smaller polynomials are positive and then put them all together at the end and get that the whole thing was positive. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do in two dimensions and it will be pretty clear how it generalizes to multiple dimensions. What we're going to do is we're going to take the positive quadrant and we're going to cut it into four regions. Okay. And in each of those four regions we're going to um, make a new polynomial from our original polynomial <coughs> with the property that this new polynomial being positive on the whole quadrant means that the original polynomial was positive on its associated region. Okay. So uh, we're going to do this by looking at each region separately and separately we're going to transform it into the full quadrant. Okay. When we do this transformation, we'll do the same transformation in the polynomial and, um, and we'll see uh, that the, that polynomial being positive implies that the original was positive in its associated region. Okay, so let me describe that to you. So let's look at the uh, northeast region. Okay, this already looks a lot like the first quadrant. Right? We just need to translate it a bit. So if we translate it by x bar in both coordinates, 
we have this new polynomial p northeast, which is defined to be p evaluated x plus x bar and y plus x bar. Right, it's pretty clear by just doing a simple substitution that if p northeast is positive in the first quadrant, then p was positive in the northeast region. Okay. Southwest is not as clear, but not too difficult. Right? Southwest was a finite region. We need to make it into an infinite region. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to invert both coordinates. Okay, and now we're in the, the middle picture. And again, now we look like northeast, and so we just need to translate by 1 over x bar this time. Problem is, this isn't a polynomial anymore. Okay? So we need to multiply by a correction factor. And here, this dx and dy are simply the degree of x in our polynomial p and the degree of y in our polynomial p. And this will, will um, cancel out any of the denominators, and, and we've got ourselves a polynomial. Okay, it should be clear now, given these two transformations, how we would transform northwest and southeast. The picture here is for northwest, uh, but southeast is exactly the same by just um, exchanging the, the variables. Okay. So I claim now that if all four of these polynomials are positive in the entire first quadrant, then our polynomial was positive in the entire first quadrant. Right? We just uh, stitch them all back together and, and we've got positivity. So for each of these four polynomials, we're going to use our two tests our positive coefficients tests and the tests where one of the coefficients or some of them on the quadratic terms can be negative. Usually this, this is actually enough. So it's kind of surprising that, that just breaking it up into these four pieces works. And I believe it's because uh, of the fact that there's a minimum point at the equilibrium and a minimum point at zero, right? Because we're kind of, ex we're, we're increasing away from these points. And so what we're really doing is looking at regions where our polynomial is, is increasing in some direction away from our equilibrium. Occasionally, uh, both of these tests will fail on one of the regions. In that, yeah. yeah. So let's see, going back, when you chose the, when you subdivided the first time, right. x bar is that? Yes, that's that, equilibrium. That is the equilibrium, but if you repeat this. If you repeat this, yes. So it's not, so when we do the subdivision, um, <coughs> it's not entirely clear what we should use. Since I'm programming the algorithm, I want a canonical way to subdivide. So if we've got our original subdivision, all right, so this is x bar and x bar. Um, in, in this southwest <coughs> region, we're just going to cut it into four equal regions, right, and continue that if we need to. Um, in the other regions, what we do is we actually uh, make them finite by inverting the, the coordinate that corresponds to the finite or the infinite um, dimension, um, and then do the same thing. We'll cut that that new region, finite region, into four regions and continue on in that way. So you could choose whatever you want um, as your second subdivision um, because you've, you've used up your, your obvious subdivision. Okay, so typically we don't need to do that many subdivisions. Um, occasionally we get stuck in a case where uh, we don't really terminate and at that point we have to try to increase k and, and try again. Uh, let me now summarize the stability algorithm uh, from start to finish. So we've got our rational difference equation uh, with a unique equilibrium. Remember, that's important. We then created our vectorized um, difference equation. Um, and next, we conjecture a k. And this is the part that I didn't say anything about. Okay? So we've got this uh, ratio that we want to be less than 1. What we can do is we can look at that ratio. We can start with k equals 1. Look at the ratio <coughs> and try your favorite function and maximization technique. Gradient, ascent. Um, simulated annealing, the metropolis algorithm, um, for a bunch of seed values. And if we ever get to a point where the, we've evaluated this ratio at some point uh, and we get a value that's greater than 1, we know that that k can't work. Right? So then we have to increase k and try again. Okay, so it's not the greatest, uh, but it's a way to conjecture a k. And once we've got that conjectured k, we create this polynomial, and then we try to prove that it's positive. Okay. In multiple dimensions, we just need to subdivide this positive orthant into a number of regions so that each of the associated polynomials um, is, is able to be proved positive with one of our two tests. Okay. Now, I've programmed this algorithm in Maple, and I want to show you quickly um, one of these runs of the algorithm. So to remind you, this is our rational difference equation. Um, and here we go. 
Yay, we finished. <laughs> right, so it took less than two seconds. And the output here means that for the equilibrium value 2, um, the k value that works was 5. Uh, and right before that, this is telling us that in each of these four regions, um, one of the two tests worked. And let me also show you the polynomial so that you see why this programming it is actually really necessary. So this is the polynomial that we're showing is positive. It's not something that I'd want to do any of these, um, these substitutions by hand. <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you about some of the results that I've been able to show with this algorithm, um, but I want to do it in a more general setting. So we've assumed so far that all the coefficients we have are actual positive numbers. We've picked values for them. But it turns out that we can prove some cases in which the coefficients are parameters, as long as the equilibrium that we get is a rational function of our parameters. Okay. So here is an example where we've got this rational difference equation, and A and B are just arbitrary parameters that we require to be positive. The equilibrium here is this rational function in A and B. So when we create our polynomial, uh, we get a polynomial in Xn, Xn minus 1, and A and B. So we now just need to run this positivity algorithm instead of in two dimensions, now in four dimensions. Okay. And we can do this in some cases. So here's a list of the cases that I can do up to order two. So I haven't gone farther um, in, in many cases, um, so these are the results in order two, where I can do it when the, parameter, when the coefficients are allowed to be parameters. I have many other results where the coefficients are numerical, so I can pick a specific rational difference equation and try a whole lot of values for the, param for the coefficients um, and spit out some answers. But typically, um, the k value kind of varies depending on the coefficients. In these cases, the k is constant um, for any of the coefficients. So it's typically one or two in these, um, in these uh, uh, cases. Okay. So now I'm going to move away from global asymptotic stability and talk about the other two phenomena. So first, briefly, I'm going to talk about um, the surprising integer sequences phenomena. So in 1989, uh, Michael Somos came up with this recurrence here. By the way, he's right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is here. Um, so, so he conjectured that this recurrence here produces a sequence of integers when the initial conditions are all ones. Okay, and this is the sequence that we have. Um, and it's, of course, in Sloan. Um, so it was, able, it was proved a couple of years after it was conjectured, three or four, I think. Um, and, and from then on, people have looked at this phenomena and tried to find more recurrences that satisfy this phenomenon. Right, so we, we know that it's going to produce rational numbers, right? because our initial conditions are integers. And what we're doing is we're, we're taking a combination, uh, multiplying and adding previous terms, and then dividing by something. So we know we're going to get rational numbers. And we're surprised when we see these integers show up. Okay. So my interest is now looking at um, similar recurrences that also have this integrality property. So working as an undergraduate in a research group at University of Wisconsin, another undergraduate, Paul Heidemann, and I looked at this recurrence here. So it's very similar to the Solis <coughs> recurrence. Uh, but instead of every term having degree 2, we now have mixed degrees. So two terms here are degree 2, and 2 are degree 1. And again, I'm taking the initial conditions to be all equal to 1. Okay? Uh, we conjectured that this recurrence here produces integers if and only if these conditions hold, or one of these conditions hold. And the condition is on our shifts in our variables. So we've got um, n minus k, n minus i, n minus j. And so if k, i, and j satisfy any of these criteria, uh, we conjecture that we have an integer sequence being produced. Okay, some of the progress on this conjecture. In this 2008 paper, we proved the following case. So k is odd, i is 1, and j is k minus i over 2. And the way that we proved that, that this recurrence produces integers is by looking at the sequence and showing that it also satisfies a linear recurrence with integer coefficients and integer initial conditions. And of course, if we've got a linear recurrence with these properties, we're going to produce an integer sequence. Okay? Um, and then in my thesis, I showed the analogous